Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Um, please feel free to let us know where you're signing in from. Uh, you will notice uh, that this webinar allows you to turn on your camera and unmute yourself. And we just ask that you leave your microphone on mute for the duration of the presentation. And you're always welcome to raise your hand um, and ask questions during the presentations using, using the chat. Um, feel free to do so. I'm just gonna keep letting people in here and we will start in just a few minutes. A lot of people still trickling in here. Let's see, people are starting to drop their location in here. I have people joining us from Washington, D.C., from Panama City Beach, Florida, Cleveland, Ohio, St. Louis, Missouri. That's where BGS headquarters is. Uh, let's see, Boston, Rochester. Good to see everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll start in just a few minutes here. Uh, we're just still letting people into the, uh, into the event here. Um, so we will give people a few more minutes to jump in here and we will get started soon. Again, I just wanna let you know that you cameras are uh, available to be turned on and the, and the microphone, uh, we ask you that you leave it on mute um, throughout the duration of the presentation. Uh, you are welcome to ask questions by dropping them into the chat. And we will have a live Q&A session at the end of the event. Let's see, we got people from Austin, Chicago, Hong Kong, France, Mexico, Lima, Peru, Winnipeg. A lot of people joining us today. Thank you. We have a very international audience today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, people are still popping in here, but I'm going to go ahead and jump into my intro. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Uh, hello and welcome to Reshaping the Organization, AI and Organizational Wellbeing. It's a BGS Advantage webinar in partnership with IE University. I want to take a second to highlight our relationship with IE and the scholarship they offer exclusively to BGS members. IE has been associated with BGS since 2015 and welcomes all BGS members into their full-time master's degree programs with a scholarship that covers up to 15% of your tuition fee. You can find out more by visiting IE University's uh, page on our website. It's my privilege today to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Sandra Comas. She's currently a visiting professor at Brown University and IE Business School. Sandra discusses the topics of leadership, culture, social impact, and creative business thinking. She is also a consultant and a speaker who has worked with many companies, including PricewaterhouseCoopers, ADECO, Kempinski Hotels, IPG Media Brands, Gotham Asset Management, and many more. For 10 years, Dr. Comas has specialized in finance, working at Morgan Stanley Smith Barney, and TIA Pref managing $1 billion in portfolios and achieving number one in client relations. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sandra Comas to the virtual stage. Good day, uh, everyone. I'm delighted to see you here. And thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Matt, for the introduction. And thank you for all the members of our team and all people here today, we have uh, just a few minutes together and we wanted to focus on the changes, the transformations within our workplace and how these are being driven by artificial intelligence and how this in turn has an important impact on our organization. So let's go ahead and start right in. <clears throat> We'll be focusing on a few questions today. Some of these are what changes you would like to see in your current organization. 
how you believe that AI can be used in the organization. What is AI? How can AI have an impact on the diversity, well being, and happiness of our workplaces? What can facilitate an integration and use that is intelligent of artificial intelligence? And finally, what are the wider effects of AI use in organizations? So let's begin with the first question, which is what changes would you like to see in your organization? Now, these don't have to be limited by AI, but perhaps our further discussion will be responsive to this. If you like, you can either write a comment in the chat or you can make just a note to yourself so that you keep a record of it. But think just for a moment about what kinds of change you might like to see in your current organization. And we can look at some of these questions or notes that you've taken later on in our session when we go to the Q&A. I've put together just a few of the impacts that artificial intelligence can have in an organization. And I'll highlight a few of these. One is the advance in customer service. Another is our ability to gather and analyze data, derive insights that can give us opportunities for more customized marketing, more customized knowledge of our clients, be able to do predictive forecasting, which will enable us to cut costs and also to be ahead of the curve with regard to our competition. It can be helpful for talent management for improving efficiencies, for optimizing our use of resources. Certainly artificial intelligence can both exacerbate and also mitigate bias in hiring and in our own belief systems. And we also find that we can do better decision-making with the use of data and data analysis through artificial intelligence. And finally, as we will be discussing in a few moments, we can also use artificial intelligence to improve diversity, well being, and even happiness in the workplace. So let's just take a quick moment to consider what is artificial intelligence. And I just want to point out a couple of aspects of this. One is that artificial intelligence comes from us. It comes from the human mind and human rationality. And artificial intelligence essentially is mimicking our own rational and intelligent processes through computer systems. And therefore they enable us to be better served in analyzing data, gathering it, using it for the purposes of our organization, communicating with other people, and even potentially to have robots and robotic assistants. Finally, we can see that artificial intelligence can help us to solve problems and to better enable a good workplace. So let's have a quick look at some of the impacts of artificial intelligence in our organizations. We see that if we divide the world into different size companies, and today it's valuable for us to see this because the largest organizations in the world, what we call now mega corporations, these companies own the lion's share of the capital and have access to the lion's share of clients throughout the world. Microsoft, for example, is one of the few organizations where the brand name and the products of the organization are available in every country on earth. This was something that even 20 years ago was completely unfathomable. And that means that the stage for our competition is totally changed because 
we are competing oftentimes against organizations that have a reach to all of the same clients that we would like to reach. So a few of the impacts for larger companies with the use of AI are scalability, as we've been discussing, competitive advantage, as we have also just mentioned, data generation and use. Large companies have the opportunity to access vast pools of data, which is a huge competitive advantage, and they also can target and analyze the use of that data with highly customized algorithms. And finally, the way in which we use our limited resources is very much enhanced and enabled by artificial intelligence. And this may be true, many of the factors or the characteristics I have just described are true not only for large organizations, but they are particularly powerful in large organizations. Let's take a moment to look at the impact for small organizations, for startups, and for mid-sized companies. So for example, we have greater flexibility and agility in a smaller sized company which means that we might need to train fewer people or educate fewer people. We might have less resistance and more buy-in for these changes because artificial intelligence can help to take over tasks that human beings may not like to do that are repetitive tasks that can be automated. And this can free up capital and resources for a smaller organization. Additionally, as we've just mentioned, the mega corporations have a huge competitive advantage with regard to their worldwide scope. But smaller organizations and middle-sized organizations can have that same competitive advantage while retaining the advantage of being smaller and potentially knowing their clients better. Smaller and mid-sized organizations typically have greater domain expertise, which means targeted expertise in the markets in which they've been working, and they can better utilize that information to branch out or to deepen their relationships with the markets in which they are working. Smaller organizations and mid-sized organizations are also closer knit. People might know each other better, and it may be better able to understand what are the specific areas of the organization in which change will be most impactful. And that could be optimizing operations or supply chain or different types of outreach to prospective or current customers and marketing. And finally, smaller organizations oftentimes are much more aware of local communities and this intersection with local communities or multiple communities is oftentimes a huge competitive and market advantage for such companies. Let's just take a breath for a minute. And now we're going to look at a step-by-step -step guide to some of the possible changes that we could bring into our organizations. One of these is increased diversity. Another is greater focus on well-being and happiness, which I'm sure many, if not all of you know, is very much a trend in business management and leadership. We're seeing generational differences and newer generations and frankly, even older generations who are necessary for the workforce, for their institutional knowledge and for their relationships with clients these can be facilitated by integration of artificial intelligence. Although artificial intelligence may represent an investment for many companies, both with regard to bringing in the expertise to set up artificial intelligent systems and also do whatever type of education or training or reskilling may be beneficial to the organization. The cost efficiencies are very significant once we enable artificial intelligence. I'll give just one quick example. I'm on the board of directors of a digital energy company. 
and that company is able to cut the use of fuel by over 30% per trip of the largest ships and shipping companies in the world just by being able to continuously reroute because of changes in air and sea currents, representing a huge cost savings and also greater safety for the movement of those goods. And finally, we will speak for a few moments about the wider world impacts of our uses of artificial intelligence. So let's begin. How can we build diversity in the workplace? So I'll just go through a few of these. And again, if anybody has questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And uh, we will we'll end in time to take questions and we can discuss these questions when we get to the Q&A part of our session today. Inclusive language analysis. How often is it that we're working on global teams and people may have trouble understanding each other? or people may be reticent or shy about speaking up or bringing forward a very important point, or even perhaps disagreeing with others, which we know is very helpful in advancing good decision-making. And all of this can be facilitated by the use of artificial intelligence, which can uh, do inclusive language analysis. Also in talent management, one of the greatest problems that we have and have always had, it's the most expensive area of most of our organizations and also the area in which we have the greatest ongoing expenses because of turnover or because of uh, the reality that sometimes people we hire don't actually uh, either fit in the organization or enjoy the role to which they have been uh, brought in. and. So we also have the ability to put in all of this data about our candidates, and that data can go through a rational system of reading resumes, and thereby can either mitigate bias in our talent management, or also help us to target the specific characteristics, capabilities, and experiences that will help us in talent management. So we can better pool diverse talent because we have greater reach through media, networks, and online communities by using artificial intelligence. We have more ability to create flexible work schedules. We can better understand what we mean by culture for our organization. And we can also gain feedback about the people we might hire or the people who are already working with us regarding how engaged they are and how they feel about the work that they're doing. Let's go on to a related topic. How can we create greater well-being and happiness? Artificial intelligence significantly enhances our communication and our communication channels. We can put anything that we write through AI. We can automate responses to customers, suppliers, and other people who are in our community. And we can even get feedback from AI regarding our own communications. We also can customize the training and development of employees. This is huge for increasing happiness, well being, and diversity because we may be bringing people in for a certain job, but we still need them to have training and expertise in other areas of the organization. So, the ability now to actually customize learning in such a way that people, for example, can engage with certain types of learning and spend more or less time in it go to related topics, and they can customize their own education so that they are able to fill in gaps and advance in the areas that are most meaningful to them. And we no longer have to have a one-size-fits-all form of training. 
uh, probably many of you know that we have the ability to assist in mental well-being. I uh, helped to create an app a couple of years ago during the pandemic in which workers in the field could answer questions with images during the day and all of that information could go back to main offices or offices hundreds of miles away. And it became a much better way to see how people are doing in remote fields, people who are in remote offices and be giving feedback about their mental state and also of course their physical safety. And uh, we found in our, in our pilots and in our work in that app that people really appreciated it. They were speaking with a bot, but that information was going forward to real people and people could make a phone call. And that also increased happiness at work, commitment to the work, a sense of well-being, and it helped to combat what is the number one problem in the world today, social problem, which is people feel isolated and lonely oftentimes. And this is very helpful for that. As we had mentioned earlier, we have all kinds of people in the workplace. We might have uh, mothers or fathers who need to spend time with the family at certain hours of the day. We may uh, have people who have certain kinds of disabilities. We may have people who quite simply could go to the office and could have what we would call regular work days, but maybe they wanna spend more of those days out of the office, depending on what the organization wants. Maybe they want to be in the office three days a week, or maybe they want to have a four-day work week and spend one of those days remotely. AI, I and myself am thinking of signing up for this service. There's all kinds of AI service where you can just feed everything that you have to do into the AI algorithm, and it will produce your schedule for you, including how long it's going to take you to do each task and on what days you're gonna be able to have time in order to accomplish that task. So we have this well-being monitoring. We can also test for cultural competency through simulations and immersive experiences. And this cultural competency is also essential for us today as we have clients and we work with people who are around the world. Let's take a moment to look at adoption of AI. In your view, thinking through your own organization, what do you think will be necessary to adopt AI more fully into your workplace, into your business plan, and to adapt to these changes, not only in yourself, but if you are managing or leading other people, how will it help you to help them to adopt these AI systems and also adapt to them? So I've put together here just a brief list with some ideas of what can be done. And some of these will be having a clear sense of what are the priority needs and goals of the organization. Is it a priority to cut costs? Is it a priority to do targeted talent management? Is it important to be able to give more frequent evaluations of people's happiness or of people's performance according to whatever our the keys in your performance evaluation. Whatever those priority needs and goals may be, AI will enable the organization to be able to put those on the front burner and to be able to do so through data analysis, predictive forecasting, perhaps even getting sentiment feedback and open feedback from our employees and thereby be able to be, just as the ships I just described, we can put our own organizations on the best route out at sea. We can begin with small experiments at lower risk, at lower cost, get feedback from these smaller experiments, 
identify what is the data that really is relevant to our organization and our clients, and then to be able to go forward, choose the appropriate AI technologies, have a test pilot in which we try this in a particular region or office or an area of the business, learn from that experience, integrate the learning, reiterate it, remake, assess, improve, and finally, improve and review across the organization to find employee feedback, the organizational impact, the effect on costs and profits, the ethics and how they are seen in the workplace and by the world beyond, and finally, to get further feedback about the well being of the people with whom we're working. So let's do a slightly deeper dive into this and look at how specifically we can reshape organizational well being. And again, these are just some ideas. This is obviously a much larger project. But as I'm saying, we start small. And today I'm starting with a variety of topics to get an overview and a picture of how this can be valuable to us. So one is that most organizations find that a growth mindset or what some organizations call an improvement mindset is very helpful for the happiness of our employees and certainly also for our clients. Daniel Pink and Dan Ariely, both well-known behavioral experts in business organizations, shown have shown for over 30 years that people want to develop mastery in what they do. They want to derive meaning from what they do. And when they have those, they are much happier and they are much healthier at work. So we can have more opportunities to educate people so that they develop more mastery. And that includes, includes experiential education. People see that they're improving, they're more likely to stay with our organization when they know that they can grow with us and that they will be continuously reskilling. We can also facilitate collaboration. I was just in putting together this PowerPoint for today. I did it within a modality that has an AI engine. And I was asked at the outset if I wanted to collaborate with other people in the making of the presentation. It is so easy to collaborate with the use of AI systems, whether it's something just like today's presentation or a large project at work, AI enables people in all different time zones, from all different languages, of all different ages, of all different competencies and capabilities to be easily able to work together and to work efficiently. Why some people are sleeping, other people are working, while some people are out on a vacation, other people can continue to move the project along. We also can predict with the data how people are feeling, what makes them feel better, what kind of activities we might promote, what sorts of recognitions, what sorts of groups we can form, all of which we know from human resources significantly improves people's happiness at work. They want to feel that they are recognized. They want to feel that they are being given an opportunity to advance and to get better at what they do. And they want to have a certain amount of autonomy and respect in which to do it. And AI can give us the analytics that will provide us the entry points to be able to contact people, make changes, recognize people, congratulate them, or move on to another step uh, with regard to advances in the organization. The last two on this list that I will mention are the automation of routine tasks. Most people don't wanna work doing routine work. 
and AI can facilitate this and can take over such tasks. And finally, AI, especially in smaller organizations that may not have the budgets for large scale research, can give immediate access to relevant research and the data analysis for that research. Let's look at a couple of specific areas besides well-being that can be improved by AI and also impact well-being. One is the types of ethics and ethical considerations of our organization. And another is how we can cut costs, improve efficiencies so that people's work is more interesting and more uh, enjoyable for them. With regard to ethics, we know that AI can skew information and create bias. We've seen that, of course, in the political sphere. We saw that with Facebook, which is now called Meta. And we have seen this in many organizations that have used data and manipulated it in one way or another to create bias. And so this is something that we need to be aware of. It also can help us not only in talent management, but in all levels of our organization, we may have biases about people or about systems and processes. We may have biases about our suppliers or our collaborators and operations. And by running our data through predictive analytics, we can see if there have been unseen biases that are causing us to be less efficient or less profitable. We also can use artificial intelligence to increase transparency because of all of the data that is collected, because of all of the additional means of communication, because of the increase in factors we may wanna bring into our decision-making process. We can even run AI scenarios to see what would be the consequences of our decisions and our policies. We can increase ethics awareness with artificial intelligence, again, through education and through use of data. We can increase trust with our customers and clients, either by gathering ongoing information or by making chatbots available that can collect data for us that we can analyze and we can see. And we can continuously monitor not only the workplace, but also the engagement with our customers through what are often called ethics audits. And we can look at the feedback and see if there are course corrections that we need to take. With regard to cost cutting, as we've mentioned, there may be processes that we can automate. There may be ways that we can actually provide assistance, chatbot assistance to our employees so that there are tasks that they don't need to do or they can be given priority tasking with greater time for those priorities. And also because collaboration is facilitated, we can oftentimes complete jobs better in less time. We can use predictive analytics, for example, just for maintaining our systems so that we don't have to deal with a crisis, but we can predict possibly bad outcomes if we don't make changes. We can optimize our processes by doing data analysis and seeing what are the inefficiencies in the different areas of our business. We can engage in risk assessment and fraud identification. And by automating tasks, we may cause job loss, but knowing that there are tasks that we will automate can also enable us to prepare people to reskill, either to stay in our organization or to reskill for the purpose of a next job outside of the organization. What are the potential negative impacts of AI adoption? We've seen that there could be jobs lost. There will be some resistance to change, which we can discuss in a moment if you like. We can 
ask people to reskill, and some people may not want to reskill. They may be people who've been there for a long time, or they think that everything is great the way that it is. They also may think that they had developed the current systems, and they may have either an ego involvement with that or a sentimental involvement with that. And they may see change as being negative rather than positive. We also could see a potential expansion of the gap between those who have access to learning in our organization and those people who don't. What we call the gap between knowledge intensive workers and other workers. And so knowing that this can happen, we can address it and we can prepare for it. We've said a moment ago that AI can increase transparency, but it can also decrease it. If there's going to be bad actors and there's going to be a data set that is not appropriate for the questions that we have, or if the algorithms are skewing the data to cause us to make decisions that are not wise ones, then a lack of transparency about how we're using artificial intelligence can actually cause inverse effects from the positive ones that we've just discussed. And finally, one that has emerged as a strong one for many years now, we have the matter of organizational security and privacy. And as we get smarter and better at securing our, our systems, other people are also getting smarter and better about hacking into them. And so this is an ongoing issue that most organizations take very seriously. And so just as AI can increase organizational security and privacy, it also at the same time can put us at greater risk. So with that, I want to open up the floor to questions that you may have and any discussion that you may wanna have among yourselves or with me here. So please perhaps Cherie, if you like, you might um, want to facilitate this conversation at this point so that we can go back and we can look at some of the questions that we have discussed. Sure, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Iris, I did see that you um, put a, com uh, a question in the chat. Did you wanna go ahead and share uh, your comment and um, maybe um, elaborate more on what specifically you um, are asking? Uh, yes, I can. I can elaborate on my question. So my question is uh, related to uh, first. Hi, this is Iris from Hong Kong, and hey. my question is related to the uh, negative uh, impact of AI. Uh, because you know, if the trending data, which is uh, used to train the AI, is contain uh, containing some, um, it's actually containing some bias. Like when we are using the AI model to screen for candidates, if we are trying to match uh, the uh, characteristics of the people that are already hiding the organization to the new candidates, if the training data is actually biased because the AI algorithm is actually looking for some like existing characteristics that will actually, to when they are screening the candidates, they will bring some bias uh, that will actually decrease uh, the diversity of like future candidates, which brings about the some some kind of discriminations uh, towards the new candidates. So my question is that uh, how can organizations balance such kind of negative impact and how uh, they are viewing um, the potential like the negative effect uh, with the positive with a positive effect, which is increasing efficiency. Yeah, that's a terrific question, Iris. And I, I, uh, my my answer may or may not uh, please you, but the um, the algorithm the algorithms are going to reflect the people who formulate the algorithms. And because the the AI system is essentially is responding to the inputs. And so there are, there are specific causes for these biases. One, for example, which is a significant one, is the data set itself. And so if we see that 
we're doing assessment of the feedback and we, which is necessary. And we see in our assessment that there is still some form of bias in the ways in which AI is directing us, then we need to consider that the data that we have collected or targeted or the way in which it is being analyzed is not reflecting our goal. Does that make sense to you? And in my experience working with data sets, and I'm not a computer scientist, but I have, as I've indicated, been working with an AI organization, it, uh, that art in this, and it's going to become more and more of a science the more that we get good at AI, is to take these huge data sets and be able to pare them down and use the data that is going to enable us to mitigate that bias. Also, because of machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence, we are able to enable the machines, which may be happening in the cases that you're describing, that those machines can uh, analyze the data and act on that data without waiting for a human touch, if you will. And so it may be that the way in which artificial intelligence is what's called learning from the data may not be appropriate to our goal. And therefore it is up to us to do continuous testing and experimenting with the data sets and with the analysis so that we can continuously mitigate the bias. But I think it also has to be said that bias is native to human beings. We all have biases. And our biases, in part, originate oftentimes from a desire to survive in some way. The human brain is designed for survival. And bias, for example, if I, uh, and this happened to me one day, I'm about to cross the street and I see a young child about starting out into the street, I may have a bias to run out and save that child, right? I may be putting my own life at risk, but I have a bias to save that child from that risk. And so we all have biases and we cannot be surprised that one of the principal areas that requires greater work in our science of this is to continuously learn how to mitigate the use of bias or the development of bias in the data collection and analytics that we use. That may be a longer answer than you wanted, but I hope that's helpful to you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, that's helpful. Uh, and I see uh, Brian actually echoes my point, but I think his point is kind of different. So uh, may I invite Brian to uh, continue the discussion? Thank you. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, it was kind of a, a continuation of the same thing. I mean, I personally have found, you know, that uh, the AI hiring uh, platforms tend to weed out outliers. So, you know, they, they have in mind someone that has worked uh, full time in, in a certain field for X number of years doing exposition and, you know, if you're someone that myself is, that's a career changer, um, that, you know, may be more qualified than someone that has worked at a similar organization uh, in a similar position and brings unique and valuable experience that would enhance the organization, you're just weeded out because you don't match the, the sort of profile of, of what um, the algorithm is expecting, right? It tends to weed out outliers is what I found. Yeah, so this is a really critical point. Um, let's just take as a quick example, the company of Netflix. Netflix is famous for its hiring strategy and its talent management. Uh, they were led by Patty McCord who, who transformed this. And, and uh, you bring in a really important point. Let's say a place like Netflix, which is in some sense also looking for outliers to hire, 
right? How do you put that into the algorithms to be able to allow for those outliers? Or in the case of Netflix, I'll just give one example. They found a particular index that they used for a while or early in their use of AI that was an indicator that helped them to find outliers. I'll give this example that they asked the question, what kind of browser do you use on your computer? And they found a pattern that those people who worked at Netflix who used Chrome, they found to be a better fit with the organization over the long run than those people who were using Safari. This is a number of years ago. And they discovered that the reason for that was not the difference between Chrome and Safari. It was that all people using the computers given to them by their organization had Safari come on the machine and those people who were using Chrome had decided not to use Safari and to download a different browser. And so it was the fact that they questioned what system they were using and made a decision about that that helped them to become the kind of questioning and curious people that Netflix was seeking. That's just a simple example. But it may be that over time, the each organization will find and fine tune the patterns in the people who work well in the organization and find ways to test for those patterns. I'm with you about this weeding out outliers because it can prevent the company from bringing in somebody who's called a deviant. A deviant um, means somebody who likes to debate or cause other people to have to support their claims or their beliefs. And for example, I teach leadership. It's You can always tell an organization that brings deviants into the organization, people who like to debate, keep other people on their toes, cause people to have to give good forms of reasoning and analysis to be able to make the decisions that they're making. These people are the people who advance an organization. These are the people who have what we call the innovator's DNA, which is also something we can test for, right? So uh, I'll use it for another matter, which is admission to universities. Um, I, th I, I think this is a huge conversation, but there can be no question that AI today is also skewing the admission to universities because of the advent of the common application. Students, instead of applying to three or four colleges as they did when I was applying to college, students are applying to 20 or 25 colleges. That means that colleges and universities, instead of having 8,000 applications could have 40,000 applications. And so they have to use AI in order to, to take off a certain number of those applications for greater focus. And so the point that you bring up is highly significant. I consider it to be an area that's gonna require a considerable amount of work and further analysis and further development. But at the end of the day, it's still gonna be a matter of what is fed into the algorithms what is the nature of the data sets that are being used to create those algorithms? And what are the analytics getting or not getting? And you bring up a good point, Brian, which is that we are not going to be able to accomplish any non-automated tasks without human beings involved. And this brings out another impact for us as people who work in business, which is that we need, and this has shown 40% of all organizations today in, in, in major studies are showing that they can get people with technical competencies and they can get people who have soft skill competencies, but they find it extremely difficult to find people who have the combination of both. And so we need ourselves to be reskilling and reskilling our people toward both developing what we call soft skills, which I call hard skills because they're very hard to learn, and also the other competencies because the systems that we're using now in artificial intelligence may not be giving sufficient priority to the importance of the human skill 
of working with others, understanding others, feeling sentiments as opposed to being told what they are and by whom, and also just the human capability of instinct and that institutional knowledge that we develop over time with regard to our industry, our people, and our organizations. So we're still going to be very much needed, but we may need to fine tune our skill sets. I hope, Brian, that that answer is responsive to your very relevant question. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think that there, especially now, post-pandemic in the job market, there's people used to have a job in Chicago and used to just get applicants locally. Now you're getting applicants, you know, nationally or globally because more, more and more jobs are are fully remote or optional remote. And uh, yeah, I think there, there is a balance between um, operational efficiency, which has become more necessary as volume has increased. And, but I think it, it often tends to come at a sacrifice of, of quality. And I think there's a balance there. And, and, you know, I, I completely agree with this. This is a personal story, but my daughter was applying to, to financial services companies and she wasn't getting any response. And I just, um, I just said to her, just walk into the alumni office of your college and ask them if they can tell you anybody who works at an organization you want to work at. And, you know, somebody in the office knew somebody who worked at exactly the organization she wanted to work at who was an alum. She, my daughter called the alum and she had a job within a week. I mean, there's no taking out the importance of knowing people and knowing people who know you well enough to know what organization or what people will be very happy to be working with you. Yes, I 100% I agree the power of networking and I think that's been lost. And I think that kind of goes back to sort of circumventing the AI and bringing the human touch in. So Absolutely. thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think that a final comment, I think we're better off thinking in that regard as AI as an assistant rather than as, a, as an immutable factor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Iris and Brian. Those are excellent questions. Uh, we have another question from Gina. Gina, if you wanted to elaborate more on um, your question regarding ethical issues. Yes, yeah. Um, I'm actually a college and student right now. So I'm transitioning from the high school workplace or just being in high school and then going into the workplace full time. And I was just kind of um, wondering more about the ethical concerns regarding using AI to essentially like do, I mean, I don't necessarily do it, but I know others have talked about it and using AI in chat GPT to write papers or look up answers for tests. And then even in the workplace, using it to write a memo or anything of that nature. Yeah. So this is a really, really good question. Thank you, Gina. And <clears throat> Congratulations to you on all of your good your good work. Um, uh, this this brings up an important point, and it's related to the questions that we've just had, which is what is it that we as individuals or we as members of groups are bringing into the work that we're being asked to provide, right? So, for example, to do the presentation today, I went into ChatGPT. I had a lot of fun with it. I have to say. At the end of the day, I think that if we look at the use of artificial intelligence as being an assistant to what we can uniquely bring to the work, we can actually feel less stress and be better able to bring forward our unique contributions, points of view, education, experiences into that work. I can remember, and I'm dating myself, but I can remember walking into a university library with thousands and thousands of card catalogs and then writing a doctoral dissertation, spending months and months and months in card catalogs versus today where I can go online and I can access today all of those catalogs of information, books and articles from my home computer and I can complete a search 
that at another time would have taken me a month, I can complete a search in a day or a day and a half. And so I think that uh, to the other side of your question, which is the ethical side of this, I think that we have to be mindful of the fact that everybody has access to these tools and they don't need you, they don't need any of us if we're not bringing something unique and important into the project. And so just by using ChatGPT, for example, in something we're doing, we're demonstrating that we don't, we're not needed. And, and so, uh, and, and everything that we do is better if we do it, if we recreate it, if we redesign it, if we rethink it, because ultimately we're working with and communicating with people and people want and can tell when we're communicating with them. I'll give a quick example. I'm in the middle of reading final papers from one of my classes. And one of the students just never spoke in class. And I started to read his paper and I was completely convinced that it had been written by ChatGPT. And I put in all of these questions into ChatGPT to see what came out. And then I continued to read the student's paper and I saw that he had a combination of some chat, chat GPT and also his own unique comments about that information and his own unique synthesis of the course readings and course materials. And so he had combined all of this. Now, it's up to, in my case, I'm a professor, it's up to a professor to determine if that is acceptable or not, if that is ethical or not. But I can assure you of one thing, which is that in organizations today are highly competitive and you're, we're all competing with people from all different countries and backgrounds. Uh, if we are not able to um, use these modalities as assistants and instead give them the responsibility for doing that work, we can be very assured that at some point or another, that will become clear because in a meeting, in a project, in I, I had so many clients uh, when I was managing multiple portfolios, imagine using AI and then walking into a client meeting as, as I was doing with somebody who's got hypothetically a billion dollars in assets. I mean, you're not gonna last five minutes in a, in a meeting like that if you haven't been actively engaged in the information and in putting together that information. So uh, the ethical side of this is very real. I think it's gonna continue to be very real. And I think we can expect that there will be a continuous development of AI modalities that will be checks on the use and the proprietary use of knowledge and information. But you, you bring forward an important point and you can, like most places of work today will allow you to write emails using chat GPT, why not, right? But you're still gonna have to read it over and you're still gonna have to make sure that it addresses the questions that are being asked and the concerns that are, that are being shared. Does that make sense to you? Yes, it does. Thank you so much for your elaboration on that subject. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Gina. I... That was a fantastic question. Uh, we do have to wrap up, um, but really quick, we did receive a question from Alan um, that asked, um, what was the name of the AI task manager that you mentioned um, at the well-being slide uh, that you presented at 921? And then also another question um, regarding um, providing courses or materials where, where um, someone can learn more about AI and the increased uh, diversity of well-being. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that, um, Sandra, for us? Yes. Uh, well, first, the name of the app it was a Hygia. I don't know offhand if it is active knit today, but we used it. Um, we used it as I, as I discussed, and uh, we found it to be very successful and very useful since that time. Uh, that was one of the first iterations of a health and well-being app. Uh, was working on that with this group, and uh, several of us were involved. It was quite uh, an exciting project. There are now out there. You can certainly Google this. There are a number of health and well-being apps, 
and chatbots that are being used in companies all over the world. And to the other question regarding um, courses and materials, I would go on to, well, of course I would recommend IE because it's a fantastic university and has courses at all levels. And we also have a lot of online courses. Another um, place to go and look is almost all universities now are giving free courses online. Many of those courses are available at a site called Coursera, C-O-U-R-S-E-R-A, Coursera, which is one E, dot org. And universities around the world have posted their uh, courses. Most of those courses are free, or if you want a certificate, I've used those courses and gotten certificates for promotions for to show that I was doing ongoing education. And you can find tons of courses on artificial intelligence. And um, most of those are free. And if they're not free, they're at a minimal uh, cost. Uh, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, probably the greatest technological institute in the United States, along with Caltech. If you go on, if you Google them, they have a huge site with free courses all related to technology. And I hope that you find what you're looking for. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and I want to thank you all for joining us today. And we really hope that you enjoyed this presentation. Um, McKenna did drop um, Sandra's LinkedIn in the chat. So um, please be sure to reach out her, to her on LinkedIn. Sandra, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, and again, thank you all for joining. Thanks to you too, Cherie. Thank Absolutely. You, yeah, thank you to all who are here. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you and good luck to everyone. Yes, have a wonderful day.